You ready? Okay. Let's uh, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this day, opportunity we have to be, uh, be gathered with you. Thank you so much for always providing and sustaining us. Thank you for keeping us in your care and in your steadfast love and continue to remind us of these days coming closer to um, the time in which you would bring things to a head on all these things that you prophetically have set forth, keeping us diligent, watchful, and um, mindful of looking at opportunities to grow with you, look introspectively at ourselves, and seem to thank you for the opportunities we have as these days prolong to growing closer with you, understanding more about you, your word, relationships we can do better at, and um, just getting better as a human being, as a servant and child of God. So we thank you, Father, so much for all you have given, continue to supply to us. Help us with these technology issues and resolve these things that are, are encumbrances and hindrances and challenges to deal with. And thank you for all the things that you have put in our lives that are trials and tribulations that help us to grow. We think of uh, the physical, mental, financial, spiritual, emotional challenges we have through life, uh, this sinful, corrupt world. Help us to get through all these things, see your hand in all those things, and see blessings, benefits, privileges, and advantages we have because of walking through those tribulations and valleys with you as our leader, our chief and great shepherd, our gentle shepherd. So Father, be with us now as we look to ongoing to this false teachings and understandings of what you have to say about these things that men hold to be true that are false and help us to hold true to you and your word. And we ask that uh, you be our counselor, our guide, our pastor, our teacher, our shepherd, our bridegroom, our everything in this time. We ask all this in Jesus' issue, his name we pray. Amen. So we got quite a few people online, I'm sure. Um, so just welcome everybody. And so today's lesson on the false teachings are going to be, we've talked about cu- quite a few already on to, to surmise false teachers or the adulterers, the false teachings are people that are children of fornication following after this. We started with the deity of Jesus, then the Hebrew Roots Movement, then Covenant Theology, Lordship Salvation, and now we're on a very dominant one, which, is, which, which pervades almost uh, the most amount of people, which is a free will uh, dissertation of people. And people say, oh my gosh, you're going to list that as a false teaching? That's, that's too widespread, man. You, you better walk on eight shells. No, I don't care what you say. It, it's not in the Bible. It's not why we keep on saying it. It, it keeps on getting in movies and in books and in, and in interviews and in everything. It's just like a, it's like a nomenclature. Like, what's the big deal, man? What's the big deal, man? The same people that think about free will being no big deal, man, are the same people that use the word Christian loosely. You believe in Christ, you're a Christian. No, no, no. We went over this like a million times. No, you're a believer in Christ. You become a saint after that. And after that, you have to earn the right to be called a Christian because Paul and Barnabas were called that at Antioch. I didn't write the book. They were styled as, doing ambassadors. They were as ambassadors of Christ, talking, living, preaching, teaching, living as if he did. How do you get that said about you when you first trust in Jesus? It's impossible. Just think about what you're saying. It makes no sense, right? I mean, you don't graduate from school as soon as you attend first grade. Are you insane? So you have to, you know, so, so it's just one of those things where people just don't understand the, 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 these words that are used this incorrectly. So when it comes to free will, uh, it's said because of a couple of things. And I said we're going to limit these false teachings to digging into three scriptures. But because this one's so widespread and it permeates through every denomination, it permeates through all humanity, it permeates through across the planet, I think it's important to note that we're going to take some three scriptures of the old and three of the new. I'm going to give more weight to this one because of the fact that people are so confused by it. And they're so enamored by it. And again, I've said people many times, I said, tell you what, I'll give you a million dollars for every verse that says man has a free will or the free will of man. And guess how much money you'd have when you're done trying to look for those verses? Zero. Because there isn't any. What? Yeah, there isn't any. It's all just in your head. They go, what? Yeah, go ahead. Go for the journey. Come with me and you'll see. It's all in your imagination. It's not true. You've been duped. Because it defies God's explanation. Free will. Where did they get it from? John 3, 16. Let's go there. Let's go for the journey. Let's go. They love this verse. Everybody knows this verse. You learned when you were a kid. If you were raised up in evangelical means, I was raised up Catholic. I didn't know what this verse was. When you're raised up evangelical, this verse is like memorized when you're little peoples. John 3, 16. Let's go to your, set, go your diaglot and read it, though. But remember, let's, we can all recite I even look in there, right? From what you're told, what you were memorized, for God so loved the world that he is only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? That is an incorrect, 
false meditation or repeating or memorization of Scripture. You just memorized it incorrectly. I'm sorry to break the news to you. But that's not what it says. I, I didn't write the book, so don't get mad at me. In John 3, 16, read your diglot, not me. Read your diglot. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Yep. Okay. But when you continue to read, he says uh, that everyone who's believing ongoing, that's an ongoing tense, so it should say everyone who's ongoingly believing into him may not ongoingly be destroyed, but may have life for the age. Doesn't that change the narrative? So let me say it more fluidly, how it should be said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, so that whoever ongoingly believes in him, will not ongoingly perish, but have life for the age. Now, what, what I would like to know uh, is if I was hearing that, like I'm supposed to, from the pew, from the audience, or you want to call it, the Bible tent, if I'm hearing that the way that God said it, and the preachers would actually say it the way God said it, my first thought would be, okay, wait a second. Whoa, pa, ho, 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 ho. Wait a minute, what do you mean by ongoingly believe? I thought I just trust in Christ and I was done. What's this mean by ongoing? That's, that's a question. Number two, yeah, it's plural. Ongoing belief, and it's plural. And then he says, ongoingly not be destroyed. Okay, what do you mean, ongoingly not be destroyed? I thought there was only one destruction. It's, uh, I, I was always told heaven and hell, and that was it. What do you mean, ongoingly destroyed? Do you mean ongoingly in hell? What, what do you mean by that? And why not just say destroyed in hell? Why do you have to say ongoing? Why is, the, why is it destroyed in the plural? What's that about? Oh, that's right, because there is a lake of fire that's separate from Hades, that's separate from Gehenna. But no one wants to talk about that. Let's not go there, right? But then more importantly, on the positive side, what do you mean by life for the age? What does that even mean? I would ask the preacher that first thing. If I was hearing that for the first time in my life, my eyes and my mind and my spirit might go to, what do you mean by ongoing the belief? But I, I would also go to, hey, what do you mean by life for the age? Because age is a phrasing that Jesus used when he said, your sins are not forgiven you this age or the age to come. Speaking of his messianic age, which is a thousand years, which did, denotes that an age is a thousand years. And you're like, hey, wait a second, <laughs> wait. So if I'm having life for the age for a thousand years, which is your messianic age, th th then what? A and why are you not focusing on the, the, the forever of, the, of it all? Because I was told that the forever of it all was what it was about. I don't understand. So right now, by, by right now hearing me say this, people who are used to normal churchianity are going, what in the blazes? I didn't write the book. Get mad all you want. Go ahead, get to call me evil and a cult person, all you want. It's fine. That's on you, because you don't want to believe what it says. I didn't write it. It says, ongoingly believing, in the diglot in John 3, 16. It says, ongoingly being destroyed. They're both in plural. Then it says, have life, not everlasting. It says, life for the age. And in the Greek language, to say eternal, you have to say ages of ages. That's not what he said. He said, life for the age. He could have said that, ages of ages. He does in Revelation. He does do that. God does that. Doesn't do it here. So why is that? Again, the problem with free will starts with this premise. They misread what they want to read and not understand the text of what it says. But let's go back to the real heart of the issue of why they see free will in this verse. They see free will in this verse because of the phrasing, whosoever will. When in the, the actual language, it just says that all who believe. The word pas, on the left side of your margin, is so that, eva, I mean so that, pas, everyone who believes, ongoingly believing. The pos is everyone, all, all who believing. They translate that in the King James, whosoever. And I remember many times when you would tell people about how you just can't believe in Christ unless God gives you the ability to, to understand that truth. They would say, well, person, whosoever, whosoever will, whosoever. And they keep on repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. I'm like, would you stop repeating it? I got it. I got it. Whosoever will. My question is, how does whosoever will translate into free will? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you an um, uh, example of that. Say we're at the zoo, okay? And we're with the fifth grade class, and I'm the teacher, and you're chaperones of the fifth graders or the third graders or whatever, right? We're, we're there at the zoo. And I say, whoever wants to go to the cafeteria, it's now lunchtime. Whosoever. Now, how do I know what parent gave their children Money for lunch, because I don't know about you, but I was raised po, couldn't afford the OR. We didn't have any money, 
to give us when we went on little trips like that. I always had to just eat an ice cream cone or, 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 or eat a bag of chips. I didn't get a sandwich. I weighed 130, by the way, growing up as a kid. I was skinny. I was a stick. So when you talk about me making this up, no, I'm not making it up. It's for real. I, had, I saw other kids during lunch hour go to the cafeteria and eat real sandwiches and meat and protein. And I had a, I had a potato chip bag or an ice cream sandwich or nothing at all for lunch. That's right. Going to school, that's what I had. So because during the time in school, there was a time we used to have this uh, government program where they gave you a free lunch blue card. And it was, uh, there was uh, sometimes my dad didn't apply in time. And, and we'd had that blue card. They would punch it. But other times, we didn't have the blue card because he didn't do his whatever he had to do with the government. And then we didn't have it. So I had to go and have nothing to eat. So if you're wondering how that happened, and I'm making it up, I'm not making it up, okay? I lived it, okay? So don't give me this garbage when, when, the, when, the, when the bell goes off, and they go, who said wants to go to the cafeteria? Of course they're talking to me, but could I, the difference between whosoever will and whosoever can. Can I, can I do that? Did I have the money? Was there food there? Sure enough, there was. Was everybody else enjoying themselves? Sure enough, they were. Did they invite me? Uh, I guess I, I heard it, but I couldn't act on it. I had no ability to act on it. I had no money, so I had nothing. So when you don't think it through, what am I comparing that to? Well, you may hear people talk about God or Jesus, or, or you, may, you may have heard and you may have read. How does that resonate in your brain, that, that, that clicks, what that means? How do you know? Who does that for you? God does. Oh, you know, because this is what people that believe in free will don't want to talk about. The whosoever will. Just because whosoever will doesn't mean you can. Doesn't mean you can. Who's the world just means all people, pos. It means everyone, Jew or Gentile, is included with that. What God's saying by that is not that everyone has a free will. No, what he's saying is that I don't any longer demarcate between Jew and Gentile because I'm doing a one new man in Christ out of Jew and Gentile. Get that to your head. That's what he's talking about. Who's the world has to do with Jew and Gentile? Whosoever, I don't care if you're black, white, brown, for God to write it down. I don't care if you're tall or short. I don't care what y'all. God said, whosoever. It doesn't matter. It isn't a Jewish thing anymore. It's an all people thing. That's what he means by that. All mankind are included in the opportunity. And that's why in heaven you're going to see all variations of all different ethnicities. You're not going to just see all white people or all black people or all Latino people. That, that's, that's an ignorant thing to think. It's not like that. It's going to be a mixture of everybody. A big cornucopia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whosoever will can, yeah, whosoever, my dad would always say, whosoever was, and, and my family, and, and our kids is going to get, you know, A's and B's because there's no dumb people in our family, and he would just beat it out of us to do well in school, because either you're dumb or lazy, he says, you're not going to be lazy, that's for sure, I'm like, <laughs> so he would beat us to, to get good grades, I'm just, that's the truth, yes, Awesome, I love it. So let's go, let's go to that, and um, I know God's going to know everything ahead of time, right? And they get that type of stuff from these Old Testament. I'm going to go back and forth from old and new. So I just I want to make sure we're established first. John 3:16 is about they like to go there because it says whosoever will. They don't realize whosoever will doesn't mean whosoever can. It just means whosoever will, meaning among all peoples, there'll be all variations of humans that will have an ongoing belief in Christ. That is what he's talking about. It is not anywhere in that verse, John 3, 16, the word pos, or everyone, believing, ongoing. Nowhere in that phrasing does it, does it say that there's a freedom that you to choose that on your own. Nope. It doesn't say that at all. The focus is on who's choosing. Not the will of you to choose, but who's choosing. That, that, that's all. Who's believing, I should say. That's what's in view there on the whosoever or the pos, the everyone in John 3, 16. Let's go to this comment that person made from work because we're going to, where they get this from is this concept that, that comes up when they, when they selectively like to read and then stop reading. Like, for example, um, as I just read from John chapter 3, verse 16, if you turn the page in your diglot, I love how people who love that verse don't like verse 36, the last verse of John 3. They love John 3, 3. You must be born again. John 3, 16. God so loved the world. Stay in the same chapter, my brother. Let's go to verse 36. He believing ongoing into the Son has life for the age. And him disobeying the Son shall not see life, but the anger 
of the God abides on him. What? I was told that God loves everybody. How could you love somebody as the toll from the pulpit when God says my anger abides on you? Excuse me. I'm just going to shelf that. But don't conveniently, to my point, leave out pertinent information that doesn't fit your narrative within the same chapter that you love to camp out with marshmallows and s'mores on. That's another plural. That's another plural. Ongoingly believe. Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy and watch, and watch how they, they, they feed this narrative of, of free will based on Old and New Testament scriptures that they leave out the full disclosure because it doesn't fit their narrative. Because their narrative is all people have a free... Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 30. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 through 20. They'll stop at verse 19, though, conveniently, and you'll see why. Let's go to verse 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 30. Behold, I have, I have this day set before you life and death. Who is God talking to? Israel. Is he talking to Egypt? No. Is he talking to Assyria, Babylon, Medes, Persians, Greeks, Romans? No. He's talking to Israel of those of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Fact. But let's leave that out, right? Just coincidentally, conveniently, leave that out, right? It's ignorant. Behold, I have this day set before you life and death, good and evil. If thou wilt hearken to the commandments of the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 30, 30 verse 16, which I this day enjoin you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to keep his rules of rectitude and his judgments, you shall live and multiply, and the Lord thy God will bless you in all the land which you are going, there to take possession of it. The land, another reference, idea, for those who don't follow the bouncing ball, he's talking to Israel. Come on, man. Verse 17. But if your heart turn aside, you will not hearken, but go astray and worship other gods and serve them. I announce to you this day that you shall surely perish and you shall and i shall not prolong your lives in the land to which you are about to cross the jordan to possess it another clue crossing the jordan possess it he's talking to israel but does it not sound like they're given a choice of life and death good and evil right and wrong sure they are because god's people are the only ones with that type of choice Duh. Because they're told by God what right is. Unless you know what right is, you don't know. You're going, I don't, I don't know what light is. How do I, where's the switch at? Where's the switch? Where's, the, I don't understand. You're blind. You don't have no light shown to you. They're still walking in blindness. The difference is God is showing a light of the law. His voice is coming from the prophets from the heavens. And he's giving them insights. Little glimpses of light here and there, but not an ongoing light. Uh-uh. Nope. Nope, they get glimpses and they, they're, they're told, oh, I got I to make sure I follow that. I got to make sure I... Yeah, they're, they're being told. Yeah. I don't know how this happens. It happens a lot. I don't know why. <sighs> Sorry, I'm going to refresh this thing. Just got to refresh it. What you have to do, you have to do this. You just have to refresh it. You just have to do this. Everything goes away. But that's the way you have to do it. You have a choice. All I have to do is just press that little thing right there. There it goes again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it does this. I don't. I, it, it's a mega meeting thing. I'm, I'm sold on it. I'm pretty certain that's what this is. It's all mega meeting, being ignorant. So. In the video, so the thing is. When, when they're in Deuteronomy and, and, and we have this whole process where God gives them a choice, God says good and evil and it's right and wrong, then you go over to verse 19, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I call heaven and earth this day to witness against you that I have set life and death, the blessing and the curse before you. Choose, choose you life that, and that you and your seed may live by loving the Lord your God and hearkening to his voice and cleaving to him. For this is the life and the lengthening of days to dwell in the land which the land I solemnly promised to your fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that he would give them. So he makes it very clear in verse 20. He's talking to a certain group of people. So yeah, does God give a choice to people to make a choice between good and evil? Sure. 
Absolutely he does. Of his people. Not of just everybody in the whole world. Where, where was that written to the Medes and Persians? Where was that written to the Egyptians? And again, I, I, I always tell pastors and teachers, go ahead and show me the verse where Pharaoh was told by Moses about the Paschal Lamb idea, about how he could have just taken a lamb, blameless, spotless, and killed it and put him in lentils and doors and prevented death of the firstborn. Tell me where he was told that information. Show it to me. Because he wasn't told, like at all. He had no shot. None. Just the way it is. So you're like, whoa. But, I, but then they want to read Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 to 19. Leave out verse 20, which makes an amplified truth that he's talking to the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob people of Israel. They leave that part out because it doesn't fit a narrative. Because their narrative is already in their mind that God gives me choices. God makes it clear, gives me choices. I have freedoms. And the problem is you're not understanding what freedoms are. So let's go to Psalm 51. Let's go to Psalm 51. Let's go to Psalm 51 and, and, and verse 5 and see what David says about how you are and your freedoms. So it says in Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was born in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. So I'm just trying to figure out. You're conceived in sin. You're in bondage to sin. Yes. Yep, but remember, and, 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 and God's people have different salvations that they can be a part of. We're going to look at that actually later in our false teachings, that there's plurals for salvations, many passages in the scripture. So yeah, they can lose, they can't lose their salvation, people of covenant, that God made them aware of who he is. They can't lose that, but they can lose the benefits of that salvation by not walking in obedience to it, which is a pathway to inheritance within that salvation. And so that's what he's talking about to your point. But again, what I just said goes over the head of everybody else in Christendom. They're like, what did you just say? I didn't write the book, man. I didn't make the words plural. I didn't write an S. I, I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't do a Thomas Jefferson and just start cutting out parts that I didn't agree with. I just accept all that it is. I don't care what denominations say, what pastors say, what seminaries say. I could care less. I'm just telling you what it says. And so when people say, oh my gosh, they, it looks like they lose, lose their salvation. Yeah, and the point is, yeah, so we see there's many salvations, plural. So why is that a problem? I get it. There's only one salvation of covenant that makes you a covenant. You can never lose it. There's one salvation in testament that makes you in testament. You can never lose it. But there's others on top of that. Yeah, there is. Yeah, sure. I... I thought we just did that. I thought we just refreshed it. I refreshed it, didn't I? This makes no sense. I, I don't know what to do. Can you see now? Can you see now? Can you see now? I, I don't know what to tell you. I got to do a whole new project with this thing. I got to be here for God knows what. It isn't just like I know what to do. I can just come here and fix it. All right, I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. So, technology is not my friend. I don't like it, and as you can tell, I'm, I'm disgusted by it. So, I, I can just only do what I can do. So, sorry. So, when it when it comes to these choices that that are being presented in Scripture, uh, the Scripture makes it clear that that in, in Psalm 51:5 we are conceived in sin. In John chapter one. Uh, he tells you in John chapter 1 uh, that the word 
who was Christ in verse 4, and it was, he was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not, which means did not capta lumbano, did not gravitate to him. Roaches don't gravitate to light. They go to darkness. If you ever seen a roach in your life and the lights go on, they scurry away. They don't like light. That's us. We're the roaches. We're the sinful, depraved creatures. We want to live in darkness. That's what we do. That's what we do. And so the, the issue with freedoms is they get, the tr they, get, they get context mixed up. So free will is not the same thing as having a choice. It's not the same thing. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Let, let's, let's, let's examine. Free meaning free to do whatever you want. But if I'm in prison and I'm charged with a crime and I'm in prison, I have choices I can make. I can, I can get a book from the library. <coughs> I can, at rec time, I can go hang out with the Bloods or the Crips or the Latin Kings. I can lift weights. I can get, no, right? I, can, I have choices. But am I free? No, I'm not free. I have choices. I can obey what the guard says. I cannot do what the guard says. Right? I have choices. Am I free? No. I mean, do, right? We get that, right? So then understand choices do not make you free. Stop saying that. Choices are just that. They give you choices. But your choices are limited or relative to the environment or the opportunity you are given or not. And that's where freedom comes in. Freedom is absolute. Freedom is absolute. They're like, no, no, no. I have absolute freedoms to do what I want to do. And then people put confines on that. Like, for example, in our country, the basic tenet is supposed to be as long as you don't harm another person or, or harm their property, then your freedoms are you know, pretty much on the basis of making it overly simple. That's kind of what our freedoms are based on. There are some parameters even within that. Right, with our so-called freedoms. Yes. Yeah, you can't buy a yacht. Yeah, for by social limited to resources, to access, to what you have the ability to do. And so, I'm free to sing and make a, a, a record. I'm free to go join an orchestra and play first chair, but I can't play an instrument to save my life, and I certainly can't sing. So I, I certainly can't be any. I, I'm free to do that. <laughs> I have the ability to do that. <laughs> So I have choices, but I'm really free to do that if I wanted to. I, not really, you know, yes. Right. And, and so the point is, if you're, if you're bonded, you're, you're conceived in sin, you're bound hand and foot, out of the, in the womb, out of the womb, you're bound hand and foot in sin, and you're blind. You're blind, you're in darkness, and you're bound hand and foot. Help me understand, when did you get your freedom to trust in Christ? I just, I'm, I'm just asking. Who gave it to you? Mom, dad, who gave it to you? You yourself just went, pow! How did you break your bonds? How did you do that without Christ? How did you open your eyes to see and see the, to see the light when Scripture says that the light appeared to darkness in John 1, verse 4 and 5, and we didn't want to even grab a hold of it? We didn't even consider that so how is it that you saw how is it that, that that you got free apart from the power of god you're trying to figure it out where's your freedom just explain that to me you explain that to me and i will concede all day long that what you're saying what you're getting confused by is once i am free from bondage once i do have light shown to me now i have choices between good and evil now i have choices between right and wrong still not really free because <laughs> i can't just do what i want I'm still under the confines of being a slave to sin or a slave to God. It's that simple. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Choose not to die. And the reality is that people don't admit they get mistaken with choices and freedoms. Cho you can have choices. doesn't mean you're free. It doesn't. You can have freedoms. It doesn't mean you have absolute freedom. And that's what's inferred by the free will of man, that you have this absolute freedom and do whatever you want, and God just knows what you're going to do ahead of time. But when the scripture was clear, we're slaves to the creator, and we're slaves to him or to our sin nature. There is no other option three. That's it. You have two options. Be a slave to your sin or be a slave to your creator. Which one do you choose? I'm going to choose B. I'm going to choose slave to my creator. But guess what? A slave I shall be. 
None of us, none of us, none, zero, none of us are, are subject to not being called slaves. You do realize that our country's disgusting white black exploitation history is because of the ignorance of some few white morons who thought the word master in scripture was referring to them. And the word slaves referring to black people. Let me make this real clear for people who don't understand. The master is God, always has been, always will be. And the slave is us. Always us. Oh, what's the matter? White supremacist man or ignorant free will person. You don't want to admit the fact that you're a slave. We're all slaves, servants to God. We are when you trust in him. And when you don't trust in him, you're still a slave to God, but just under sin. <laughs> but you don't have no, there's no autonomousness. You, like you said, you just can't, you can't just have your freedom to die when you want. Jesus said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. There, there, there's freedoms that are, again, different from choice. And even when you have freedoms, those are relative to your environment. You don't have absolute freedoms. So there's three different demarcations there. The difference between free, free will and choice is two different things. The difference between free will and free and absolute freedoms is different. I have the free will, if you people say, I have the free, I, have the, I, want, I like that phrase. I have the freedom in our country. I have the freedom to do different things. Doesn't mean I should do them. Doesn't mean I can do them. I can't. There's certain things I can't do, even though I have freedoms to do them. I, I just can't do them. I have freedoms to represent my country as a person who was born and raised here. But I can't join the military now because you can't have certain things that are physical ailments to yourself, whether they be vision issues or other bodily function issues. They, they don't even allow you in the military if you don't have certain things that cross the physical, you know, bar. So you have freedom. doesn't mean you can do it. Again, your freedoms are relative, relative to your environment, relative to your ability. And people don't understand that. They want to compare it as this, all this autonomous, well, I chose my shirt I was going to wear today, and I chose my pants <laughs> out of the closet of clothes that you had, not out of the store at Macy's, did you? Did you? You, didn't have all, you, you couldn't go to Sergio Ferragamo and, 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 and Gucci and choose whatever you wanted off the rack that cost $1,000. Could you? I don't think so. Right? So <laughs> let's get real, right? We have choices. So the reality is that they're not free. So the reality also in, in, in Scripture, you go back to, uh, the New Testament again. So let's go now to Revelation 3.20. This is one that Billy Graham made very, 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 very popular. And I heard it when I first came to know Jesus uh, as my Savior was Revelation 3.20. Yes. Yeah. They should be, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yep, they, yep. <laughs> Revelation 3.20, uh, Billy Graham and the rest of his ilk made this verse popular to represent free will. When Revelation 3.20 is talking to the church of Laodicea, and he's talking about fellowship, that's what you do. You stand, to, you knock at the door to invite people in for fellowship, but instead Billy Graham twists it and turns it into a salvation message. When he says in verse 20, Revelation 3, Behold, I stood at the door, and I knock. If anyone may hear my voice and open the door, I will enter into him and feast with him and he with me. So again, here we have in verse 20, he stood at the door and he knocks. Anyone who heard the voice of me and have opened the door, I will go in, this is ongoingly, to him and sup with him, meta, that means close with him, and meta with, with me. And the word for soon is not, it's not for with, it's not soon, it's meta. Soon is, right now we're with each other. We're all with each other online. But meta is only us here at this location here, at our, at our lo locale. Because the word soon, S-U-N, in scripture is a reference to with in a general sense, and then meta is an intimate sense. So you're going to tell me that Jesus making those words demarcated is going to then just blur the lines between being intimate with him when you first believe, automatically you gain all the access to intimacy with Christ as soon as you trust in Him. Really? You're not just, gener you're not just generally with Him. From day one, you have access like James, John, and Peter, and Paul. Really? You think that? Wow. So is your name on the Holy City too? Is your, is your, are you one that, you're the one that's going to judge the, the tribes of Israel also? Think what you're saying. Makes no sense, does it? Matter of fact, why would He put a salvation message 
to a plate to a people that again Christianity says Laodicea is a letter written to the church well they think the church is everybody so why would God give a salvation message to a church I'm just trying to figure that out because that, that is the context here is Laodicea so why is it that when they the, the, the ignorant people who are teaching this stuff are saying this is a salvation message in, John, in Revelation 3.20 how can they how can you preach a salvation message to those that are in a congregation of, uh, of Laodicea and you know what they say well, that's because they're just because you're in a driveway doesn't make you a car. Just because you're in the garage doesn't make you vehicular. <laughs> well, that's so funny. <laughs> and they go with the whole lordship salvation thing. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. And they go through the, and so that's how they back to front massage. So they bleed together all the false teachings. You see, they bleed together, and they go, oh well. Well, you see, the reason why Laodicea is being told to have salvation is because they were acting like they were knowing Jesus, but they didn't know him because they knew him here and not here, and they were short of salvation, and they didn't have fellowship with Jesus. Really? Can you show me the 18 inches part mentioned in Revelation? Can you show me that to me, please? Can you show me anywhere at all in Scripture where God uses the word ecclesia, called out, and refers that to people that do not know who he is? Please, please, please I, I, I insist. Could you please show me anywhere at all where Ecclesia is referred to anyone who doesn't know who Jesus is already. I'd love to see it. Love to see it. Because it doesn't ever exist or happen. But no, they're too busy in their narrative. They don't think it through. They're so busy forgetting the facts of what the words mean, they're into the narrative of what they think must be happening because they can't understand it's a fellowship, verse 20, emphasis of Christ desiring fellowship because they could never entertain the idea that some folks could believe in Christ and be saved in his blood, but yet not want to fellowship with him. They can't conceive of that being plausible. Well, of course it's plausible. Jesus talked about it. Well, they see it. They think they're rich and they're poor. They're haughty. They're prideful. They're arrogant. Well, how can that be if you're a person who's saved? I can't. It doesn't make any sense. We already covered that before. The Lordship, you see. They fall into it. So folks who see Revelation 3.20 as a salvation message are by default, Lordship salvation orientated or influenced. Fact. Fact. Yeah. Yeah, it's ongoing to the plural. Yep. Then you go also, look, look at this. Now you go also to, now go to uh, 1 Timothy 2. They love this verse too. 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, when Paul is talking to Timothy, who again was from a mixed family of a father G Gentile, mother Jewish. Yes. Oh, they say it all the time, but it's all made up, right? And they'll call it professors and not true believers. And it's all just man-made up terms, but that's okay. But you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and they'll go to this chapter and this verse to prove free will of all men like, to be saved in Christ, not, for, not acknowledging the context that Timothy was the first young man after Paul's experience with John Mark went south and Barnabas and his friendship was fractured, which is a very deep-rooted scar in his heart. They made right by later before he's about to die at this point. He's in the end of his life, right in Timothy. And he wants Timothy to know that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile is irrelevant to being in Christ because you're one new man in Christ. You're no longer a Jew or a Gentile. So in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says in verse 1 through 4, I exhort thee, first of all, to make supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving on behalf of all men, on behalf of kings and all who are in high station, so may not be led, a, so, that, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life and all piety and seriousness. So what he's talking about is clearly all of different types of humanity, whether you're in the poverty level or a rich level, a rulership level, a servitude level, that's what he's bringing out. He's making it very clear to have peace in your life is to accept your role and your responsibility where God has you and how that fits into where God has somebody else. Whether they are of God or not is not the point. You still pray for them. You still have their, their leadership position over you. You still pray for that God's going to use them and they're going to see God's hand and they're going to give you know, honor to God. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. It happened with Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus and Darius and Alexander. It is possible with folks that are pagan, not in tune with scriptural things, can tap in every now and then to some spiritual truth. It does happen. We've seen it. Even with Pharaoh, for crying out loud. 
Then you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. This is good and acceptable before God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, verse 4, and to come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. You see? And they stop here and go, you see? See? He wants all men to be saved because all men got a free will. No. No, he wants all men to be saved. He's talking to Timothy about the fact that he doesn't care if you're rich or poor, of rulership or of servitude, what your social station is, what your monetary station is, or whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, is all irrelevant. God wants all types of people. That's what he means by that. Again, here we go again with the pos, everyone. He wants all types of people to be saved. Yeah, sure. What's wrong with that? But where does that show free will? Where? So what? So what God says he wants Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, uh, high stations of rulership, low stations of servitude, men, women. Okay, so, so what? How's that prove it's free will? How's that prove they get there by their own accord? Where does it say that? No, they get there by God's accord. No man comes to me, Jesus said, unless the Father draws him. No man, none, uh, zero, can come to him unless the Father draws him. So, let's go over to uh, that passage in John chapter 6, which I think is ironic because it's in John 6, verse 66. It's how you never forget it because it's the number for the, anti, the beast, 666. It's when man shows their evil, depraved wickedness of their father, Satan, when they're influenced by their own evil to deny what Jesus said is true because Jesus said in John 6, 65, because to this I have said to you, no one can to me unless my father give to him, gives it to him, verse 65. Verse 66, from that, it says from this time, no, from that, that statement he just made, it says many, John 6, 6, his disciples withdrew and walked no longer with him. Not just believers, disciples. Folks that were already aligning with him as the Savior, aligning with him as the way, the truth, and the life, and they go, you mean to tell me that in my, my, my mom and dad, my wife, my kids, my family, my loved ones, my neighbors, my coworkers, you're saying if you don't let them know who you are, they just can't have their own free will choose you? He goes, that's right. They go, we're out. Peace. They left. He goes, so what? So what? Oh, oh you broke my heart. Oh, oh. Who, who, who are you? Who are you? Talk back to God. Romans 9. Who are you? Like God's going to be, oh my gosh, did I hurt your feelings? Really? Okay, Craigers, let's go. That's not what happens. Okay? Yes. Yep. Yep. God desires and makes that decision. And that brings up another verse that they get confused about. You just brought it up. God desires. Then you go then they love to go to first Peter one nine. They love first Peter one nine. Boy do they love that. Oh no, first Peter is it one nine? That's one nine, excuse me. First Peter three nine, I think it is. Excuse me. Yes, let me see. Um, let me see for a second if I got it right. No. Second Peter three nine. I I'll see I'll get it right eventually. <laughs> Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord of the promise is not slow, as some regard slowness, but is patient towards us, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to reformation. Oh, I love it. And they go, you see, you see, you see, God wants everybody to believe in him. Well, then guess what? If that's what he longs for, and it doesn't happen, which we know it doesn't happen, unless you're Unitarian, which people who argue the free will issue are not Unitarian, typically speaking. And if that's the case, well then, uh, well then, hey, wait a minute. Then by the fact that you believe people go to hell and their non-mindset, but did God fail then? They go, no, this resisted God. Since when? Since when did Romans 9 become ir irrelevant to you where God says, no one can resist my will? None. Zero. You can disobey. And then you, see, here's the problem now with that. You put, if you're a smart person, you're intellectually minded, you're analytically common sense, your logical mind should kick in and go, wait a second. Okay, no one can resist God's will, but God desires all to not perish. He's talking to his own children, and the word perish there is in the plural. He wants none of his children, because that's the audience in the first, second Peter, to experience a disinheritance unto a judgment of detriment. He doesn't want that for any of his children in Christ. But let's just say that you can't resist God's will, then wait a minute, that means that if I rebel against God and I sin, did I resist his will? Or did I just rebel that was already ordained before time, which means that God's already ordained the fact that I'm this evil way? E, yikes. Yeah, that's right, Jack. 
but you still own it because you didn't know that. That's the whole thing. I don't know when I'm going to sin. I don't know. When I, I, don't, I don't know one second from now, one minute from now, one day from now, a week from now, what I'm going to say or do is going to be sinful or think. Think, say, or do. I don't know, but I know what's going to happen. But I know it's going to happen. I don't know what it is. And God says, yeah, because you don't know what's going to happen and you chose to think it through and act on it with your emotions, then I own it. Whether he ordained it or not, which he did, it's still on my ledger of owning it for being accountable and my emotion and the time at the moment that I made that choice. I made that choice in that moment of time and with my emotions, with my thoughts. I congealed all that together and I made that decision. I can never go back to God and go, I remember that moment in time I was feeling your ordained will and then you made me do this. No, no, no. He's like, stop lying. My thoughts, my emotions, and time, I made that choice and that's why I own it. He goes, I ordained that. I, I go, I know that, but I, <laughs> but I experienced it. It was, it, was, it was as if I was doing it. He goes, exactly. And that's why you're accountable. <laughs> oh my gosh. He, he got you. There's no way around that. Yes. Yep, 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 metamelamai versus metanoia. Metanoia means turning to God, and metamelamai is turning away from your sin. Because many of us can turn away from our sin and say, I'm not going to sin anymore, but very few of us turn to God to think he's going to forgive us and accept us. We can go on. Our son who's passed on in Kent, he thought he could never be forgiven for the things he did in his past. Even though he turned from his sin and didn't do those things for many, many years, he always was living in that doubt that he would be forgiven by God himself, even though he had metamelamide already he never met Anoia, turned to god and thought god would receive him for where he was at in his walk he thought he'd never i'm just telling you so i i've seen it firsthand and and people we love my own life and that's what god's talking about he wants all of us to turn away from our sin that's a given we're going to know to do that he wants us to know that once you do that please know that i can take i'll take you as you are dirty and filthy and sinful as you are i want to restore you i'm in the restoration business that's what he does he loves doing that for us yes yeah, the bad choices have lousy dividends, right? And but God just wants you to know He, He's there for us. I, I He's that's a great Father. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, yep. So, then you go you go over to another uh, Old Testament passage. We're going to go to um, go to uh, Genesis. Uh, so, well, I don't have to go there for the sake of time. But in Genesis six five, God says the inclination of man's heart are continuously evil, continuously evil. In Jeremiah fifteen. Or no, 15, 17, Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. He says, the heart, fully, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Then in Matthew, for those who go out to Old Testament, in Matthew 15, Jesus said, out of the hearts comes murderers, adulterers, evil, wicked things. It's despicable. So again, we've talked about that before. When people say, follow your heart, I don't know why you want to do that. When the heart is wicked, continuously, imaginations are off the chart reservation with depravity horrible wretchedness so explain to me how that's how the scripture defines you and me in the old and new testament we're defined this way what do you think your freedom is hey where is a where is a, where is a where is a psychopath's freedom how he's going to kill who he's going to kill and when he's going to kill is he going to kill yes <laughs> it depends on how how who and when they're going to kill somebody okay but they're going to, it's just a matter of time, who, when, and how. And it's disgusting. That's us. We're, 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 we're depraved sinners. And we're going to sin. It's a matter of time. How we sin, when we sin, how often we sin, the, the, how deep it goes. That, that's your freedoms that you have to sin and with, without, without having Christ. No, that's right. That's right. It isn't just the blood pump. It's, it's a heart disposition in spirit. And they don't under. They don't understand this stuff. And so they, they, they ignore also, by the way, go to Romans. Go to Romans in chapter 3. So much for free will. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 also says in verses uh, 10, which is quoting Psalm 14, from verses 10 through 12, even as has been written, there is none righteous, not even one. Romans 3.11, there is none that understands. There is none that seeks God. That's ongoing. None. None. Zero. None. None that has ongoing understanding. None that seeks God ongoing. For all have turned aside. They are altogether worthless. There is none that does good. There is not even one. None. So please explain to me how you, if you don't seek God, how you conceived in sin, you don't seek God, you're born in blindness, you are darkness, 
how, where is the free will to be not a slave to sin? Where's the free will to all of a sudden see light when you're born in darkness? Where's the free will to see God when you're told you can't see God? Where's the free will to do good? You don't know what good is. Would you please help me understand? If you can do all of that because of your freedoms, then, another question, then why the cross? Why the cross? Come on. Think what you're saying. You know, they don't, they don't want to hear that. But that's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah, we're all like sheep gone astray. Then we go to where all this comes from is Luke 13. Go to Luke 13 and the parable of, of, of the sowing of the leaven and verse 20 and 21 in Luke 13. Such many years ago asked about this. And again, Jesus said, what shall I compare the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the God, which is the place in which you would have the on earth messianic reign. He's talking about of God's sphere of his kingdom. It resembles leaven that a woman taking mingled in three measures of meal till the whole was fermented. Leaven in the Old Testament, people try to make it sound like, well, leaven's good, like leaven make your bread taste good. Leaven's good here. Leaven's good here. No, 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 it's not. No, it's not. God first mentioned it in Exodus in chapter 11 and 12, and he didn't play around. He said there has to move leaven from your household because leaven rises up, puffs up. That speaks to arrogance and pride. That's why he said unleavened bread. That's why we're doing Lord's Supper today. It's unleavened bread because Christ was not puffed up. He was not proud. He was God Almighty, but he was humbled before us, which is insanely wild i would never think to, to have done that if i was him but 11 the unleavened bread feast is about reminding ourselves not to be puffed up and haughty to remember we don't deserve anything of god's blessing anything of god's graciousness anything of his benefits and love to us it's all been a grant given to us by him imputed to us remember the old uh, the old baptist thing well, well god wants to if i reach out and give you a gift what do you have to do to have that gift? You have to take it. And you see, that's how the free will of man works. God reaches out his gift and you take it. And that's your free will. And some spur in his hand. Okay, and thank you very much, weirdo. That's not how it says, okay? We talk about, go back to the study of Ephesians and the different words for gift and giving. And when God gave us the gift of salvation by grace through faith, our hand was class is the imagery in the greek language god opened up your fingers you didn't do anything you didn't do squat you were like this like paralyzed and god said <laughs> put the salvation in your hand closed it and said now you have salvation what did you do nothing zero buckets nothing 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 zero that's why jesus said in john 10 you're in the father's hand in my hand no one can take you out of our hand you know why because you did nothing to get there and you surely can do nothing to get out of that place we got you good baby once god brands you you're branded he, he's got you he's got you now the question becomes how you experience that intimacy with him how you experience that relationship that lack of fellowship or that continual collaboration with him that's between you and his choices he gives you to now seek goodness over evil and righteousness over wickedness that's on our choice once we're in christ as god's people we have choices to make No, you can't just know. No. And so the leaven shown in Luke 13, as we know from verse 20 and 21, is the leaven of the three measures of meal that God loves you without you being accountable, that there's no negative thing that can ever happen to you as a person in Christ. Well, that's not true. Jesus made that very clear when he said that he who has the master's will doesn't do it. And when he comes, he's beaten with many stripes. Does that sound like he loses works or he gets a butt whipping? It's like a butt whipping to me. And he who doesn't know the master's will is beaten with a few stripes. That's Luke 12. I didn't, and he's talking to Peter, who's his apostle, asking the question, who was that person who get the pseudo in due season? Who, I didn't write the book. But why would Jesus say that and then say it to not only Peter, but to the question he's asking about who that servant is who does the right things? And he makes it very clear who he's talking to is Peter, one of the chief people of his apostles. The question's about who his servants are going to be doing his will and Jesus brings up that statement within that context. And what do church sanity preachers and teachers do? Well, that's referring to people that don't believe in Jesus. Let's, let's not stop with the lies. That's not what he said. Stop lying. Read the whole chapter 12. Read it. Read it. That's not what he's talking about, and you darn well know it, and you're lying because you can't deal with the truth. And it's harsh. I can't. I, hey, because they, the, one of the measures of meal is God is love. 
And with love comes all softness and all pleasantries. And there is no accountability. There's accountability, but remember, God's not a fire and brimstone. I want to make you scared and off your heebie-jeebies. No, he th- it's not like that. He wants you to be respectful of your accountability and respectful of what his righteous hand and holiness can do in your life if you disrespect, disregard, devalue him. He wants you to understand there's a, there's a, there's a, there, that exists. But not be fearful of his holiness and righteousness and accountability. No, just to be governed by your inhibitions to not do the things that you normally would have done if you didn't know that existed. But knowing that exists, you could lose your inheritance. Knowing that exists, you could have your up and comings by God himself at the beam seat. Knowing that exists, you could lose out for a thousand, two thousand years and never, ever, ever live in heaven ever again. Outside of when you die and get to stay there for a little bit, you can never return again. The fact that even, that even is a plausibility. You could be in the outer, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. The fact that all those things exist should, should, should incite you to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I, I'm not going to be scared of that, but thank you for telling me, God, that there, you're not playing around, that there are negative realities for if I trust in you because you first gave me the truth and you imputed it to me, and I trust in you to continue to collaborate with you. If I don't do that, there's a detriment as well as a benefit to trust in you ongoing. That's what he's talking about. But yet the leaven being sown is that you can have love and, and, and you can go into sin and just forgive and sin. And God forgives and you sin again. And God forgives. And, 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 and that's all true, which is true. I and mean, then you keep doing it. And then, and then when you die, and then, uh, then you, you, everything's good. And then, then, then we're all the same. We are? So you're telling me you can just sin, get forgiven, sin, get forgiven, sin, get forgiven. And that's all you keep doing, a cycle of sin, forgiveness, sin, and forgiveness. And because God's love, which is true, always forgives you when you're genuine about confessing your sin and, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you're genuine and broken before him, he'll wipe it all away. That's all true. That's all true. But you're telling me that if you keep doing that, that's all your cycle is. You don't have any pursuit of obeying him, no pursuit of getting to know him, no pursuit of wanting to understand what he has to say about the future, no concern about what your obligations are about, giving back to him what he gave to you. None of that matters to you. All that matters to you is sin and forgive, sin and forgive, do what I want, do what I want, sin and forgive. And then you say, okay, I die. I'm the same as the other person, you know, like Peter, James, and John. How? You know how offensive that is to Peter, James, and John and Paul? You're serious right now. You actually think that you're the same as them, that we're all this heavenly communism in heaven. That we're all the same. When you could care less about wanting to know or live or serve or collaborate or get to understand your God, your Father, what's in store for you, what's required of you, what's, what's, what's desired of you. None of that mattered to you. Just, just have fun, be happy, and all that kind of stuff. As long as you say and forgive, that's the, that's, the, that's the premise of doing whatever, that's a, that's a code for, do whatever you want in your life. Sow your wild oats, uh, and have fun doing whatever you want to do, fame and fortune, but as long as you sin and forgive, then we're all the same. Really? Well, if that's the case, then why write a book of 20, 27 books in the New Testament, 39 in the Old? Why take so much time with so much information if that's all there was to it? Wow. Yeah, you're really making that really easy. So, that's, so you're telling me there, there's, no, there's no accountability? You see? That's one of the lies people believe. They believe, what's the big deal? They'll say things like, I don't believe like you. So free will has in, ta- has, in, has in in line with it this whole sense of no accountability. So they believe in love without this sense of accountability. And again, I'll always say this, people, and it's a simple question. You can look, look aside yourself, and if you're honest, there's no way to answer this question other than, oh my gosh, um, yeah, he's right. And that is this. What relationship do you have with someone else who loves you or you love them or with an animal, for crying out loud, even a uh, human to animal or human to human, there's no relationship ever that you love a animal or a person where there's not an accountability involved in return or expected from you when you do that. There's something expected of you, like to be loyal, to, to be faithful, to be kind, to be courteous, to be compassionate, right? You can't just say, oh, it's all a feeling. Really? You can just do what you want, say what you want, and that person doesn't, doesn't care. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do care. That's why you're accountable. That's how you show your love, through your accountability to that person. So don't act like they don't, they don't have to say, but they, 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 they go, okay, everybody go, okay, I, I, I get that. But when it comes to God, the most important relationship of all time, you don't think that matters in that relationship, that to be accountable is important. Well, no, he, 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 he took all my accountability on the cross. See, I'm, I'm all good now. Oh my gosh. See, and there's where your problem lies in with this issue. So the second measure of meal that was, that was stoned as a lie was free will. 
it goes along with this love without accountability that I have the freedom to do what I want and God knows before time. And therefore, it puts all this emphasis on me creating my destiny, on me creating my journey, on me making my own, blazing my own path instead of putting honor to solo de gloria to God alone and saying, no, God's pre-wrote the whole thing. God's already ordained everything. It's up to me to decide if I'm, am I, I going to believe that or not. We're dealing right now with, I'm not going to bore you or, or sadden you with the truth, but let's just say this is true, because it is true. Uh, we have a person in our family, extended family, whose mother and father, uh, or whose father is alive, excuse me, but his mother died of cancer, two sisters, cancer, brothers, cancer, and now his wife, with two kids, at 34 years old, has cancer. How do you think he feels right now? Probably not good, right? You think that's a good message to tell him that, by the way, God ordains all things. That means everything in your life is for a purpose and for a reason. And when his mom died, he was in military serving our country overseas, couldn't make it back in time. Never got a chance to say goodbye to his mom. She died before he could make it back. Doing what was right, defending our country. So it, there's things where God's ordained well in time, but it, it, there's traumas and sadnesses involved. Doesn't, it does, they're not tongue-in-cheek. It's very sobering. But it doesn't change the fact that God still ordained them. You know? It, just, it happens. I think about that. So, so I think, it, so we said, why does that matter, free will versus sovereignty? Because when you think of a sovereignty v- viewpoint of God, you start to see things differently. You don't see them as, I could have done this, or if I would have done that, and start to get mad at God. You start to accept the fact that all things, that God is a loving God. God is a caring God. God's a compassionate God. In a sinful, corrupt world that is ongoingly going to cause traumas and heartaches and pains and sufferings, God in it and through it has ordained things that I'm going to experience that way, but I know in and through it, He means that for a benefit to me somehow and a, be- a blessing to me somehow. And one day from now, tomorrow will be the anniversary of 10 years of my brother in law's death of committing suicide. Of which, when he committed suicide, I was not one of the people that entered the phone when he was doing his goodbye farewell tour of making phone calls to everybody that weekend before he took his life. I'll never forget that. I'm the only one, apparently, who didn't answer the phone out of all this list of people he was going down, about maybe 15 people, I didn't answer the phone. Because I was in my own little depressed fest. I wasn't having a good day. And I saw his call and I ignored it. I learned my lesson from that. Instead of being all mad at God that he's no longer here or mad at God, I can't believe that you would ordain that for him to be gone off this world and to end that way especially. and No. No, I was l- introspective of myself and, and saw what could I do more in my role and responsibility to have shown love to him and, and have given him an understanding of who God's love is to him and what could I do next time around when someone else is in their bad state. I will never again wallow in my own state of what I'm going through. I'll always give myself unto somebody else whenever they need something, whether I'm up to it or not. That's the lesson I learned. You're saying, oh, you're stretching it. No, I'm being honest with you. Does it still hurt that he's gone? It still stings? Yeah, it stings. It's gone. Yeah, he was my brother. It still stings. But the fact of the matter is that it, 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 the blessing and benefits what I focus in on, not the sadness or anger or resentment, none of that stuff. No regrets. It's just a matter of reflecting and, 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 and gaining some benefits from the bad things that happen in life. And when you think of a free will mindset, it's all about, you know, positive, cheer, cheer, I'm empowered, I got the right... When you think of a sovereign God issue, you're in a servitude mode. You're in a humble subordinate mode. And you begin to then see your reason and purpose for existing from God's viewpoint, not from what you want and you desire. Yes. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's, it's just an amazing thing that, that happens in, in Scripture about the measures of meal. The love, that accountability is one measure of lie, of leaven that puffs people up to think that they can, God loves me, therefore how can he possibly hold me accountable? God puffs them up that says, God gives me choices, therefore they, they bastardize that choice and they say, oh, therefore I must be free in my will. No, you have a will, you have a choice, you're responsible, you're accountable, it's just not free, it's relative. And last measure of meal, of course, that's a lie in Luke 13, 20 and 21, the level is the, the details in scripture, that generalizations are all that matter, that the that, that, that scripture is about God's love and forgiveness. That's it. At the New Testament, it's about God's love and forgiveness unto mankind. And as long as you see that message, the parables, don't be confused with the details. They're just stories. They're just stories to represent God's love and forgiveness. They're just stories. 
everything that happened in the Bible with Jesus and the apostles and with the epistles that they wrote. They're all just stories and, and anecdotes and, and, and historical things just to remind you of one basic thing. God loves you and God forgives you. They're just stories. They're just stories. Don't get all caught up in the, in the theology and in the, in, the, in the truth of what God said. That, that'll, that'll, muddy, that'll muddy the waters and get you all confused and all intellectual. Just remember, God loves you and forgives you. It's all that matters. That's a lie. That's not all that matters. That's true. That's not all that matters. And by the way, I would argue it's even more palatable and more resonating to how much God loves and forgives you. The more you learn, the more that becomes a realization that deepens in your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. So those who think that's the best thing for you, I would challenge you then to study more about who God is and his word um, on the truth of what he has to say. And I guarantee you, you will deepen by far your understanding of how much he does love you, how much he does forgive you, because how much you learn about that word of God, how it condemns you for who you are and, and damns you for what your disposition is. And yet still he loves you. Still, it's amazing how we make mistakes and he still picks us up and dusts us off and says, get moving forward, daughter, son. You fall six times, you get it, you get up seven, you get up. And he makes you just continue to be reminded of his love and his restoration and his, his care for us. But it resonates even more. The more you know, the more it resonates. And it, it builds deep roots of sterizo, again, establishing you deeply in that understanding of who God is and what his word says. Yes? Yeah, I know. It's a crazy time. So this whole issue of, of, of God's uh, free will thing, then they go, I want to make sure people understand that they, they don't understand the phrasing of the world. So if they understood the difference between, the biggest problem with free will is they don't understand the difference between free will and choice. Choice just means that you have options. You have options. Okay. But freedom means that you have more than options. You have the autonomy to make choices outside of options given to you. You can make up your own options. Maybe. So freedoms are, are, are relative to your options, to your abilities. So choices are just options. Whereas freedoms are relative to your options, to your ability. Remember what Jesus said in the, in the talents? He gave to each one according to their ability. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. He gave each one according to their ability. Interesting, right? We talked about that way long ago. But to, to make sure you're clear on something, I want you to go to John. Go to John uh, and, and also in John 15. You're going to see when Jesus uh, spoke about uh, the world. In John 15, he says it this way. In verse 18, he said, it, the people don't, it's about freedom, so the, the, so the free will people that have the confusion between choices and free will, choices are options. Freedoms, which they say free will, I hate that phrasing. Freedoms are relative to the options and ability to act on those options. So am I free? Who's the only one who was free in the entire Bible? Ready for this? Jesus. He's the only one. He could do what he wants, when he wants, without restrictions. You say, well, the man and woman in the garden were free. They had no sin. They had restrictions, didn't they? Don't eat of the tree of good and evil. That's a restriction. Freedoms have no, they had, they had, they had, they had relative freedoms. Jesus, Yeshua, God the Son, is the only one of absolute freedom to do whatever he wanted. And that's why Philippians 2 says he considered it not robbery to consider himself equal with God the Father, meaning he had agreed before time to be subjected to a subordinate, being God of very God, to work in a subordinate role as God the Son. He didn't for a millisecond decide to act on his absolute freedoms. He could have, because he's the only one who had them, who walked on this soil with him. He's the only one with absolute freedoms. Everybody else has relative freedoms. Relative. It's not free will. You have relative freedoms by what God has restricted you from or given you permission to do or not do or enlighten you to. Yes? It's it's a it is it's a it's a falsehood because they keep about they keep talking about again it's it free will takes away from the will of God it detracts away from the sovereignty of God and it elevates and deifies man as if you have some type of autonomous ability to usurp God's will and you don't you don't because Satan thought he had that too and he didn't he wants us to believe the same lie you shall be as God knowing right from wrong which is meaning you have freedoms to choose right from wrong. 
That was the same lie he said. Be as gods. For what purpose? To choose right from wrong. To see it for what it is. That's what he was saying. What's that lead to? Free will thinking. That the lie comes from him. He's the liar. He's the author of lies, remember? So you go to John 15, 18. If, he says, if the Jesus is going to use this phrasing now about the world, so cosmos, world, means the human populace. But the cosmos is particularly those in the populace of mankind that are of covenant. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but she didn't, yep. Yep. Yep, she didn't know what she didn't know, and she, did, she had relative freedoms with restrictions of doing what God said. Verse 18, if the world hate you, John 15, 18, if the world hate you, the world hates you, and then you know that it has hated me before you. If you were, in the left side of your margin, if you were out of the world, the world would then to its own kiss you or love its own. But because of out of the world, you are not, but I chose you out of the world on account of this, the world hates you. You know what he's talking about? He, and what's in the world he's talking about are the Jewish people. The world in John 5, 19 is not talking about Romans and Greeks. No about the Jewish people hated those who Jesus called out as his 12th. And by the way, if you don't understand that, read the book of Acts. You don't find the Roman procurators going after the, Jew, the, 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 the apostles. The Jewish synagogue people were. Ananias was. Caiaphas was. They were going after him. Remember with Peter and John? And Peter goes, I can't recant before you. I, 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 what's, the, what's better, to, to please man or please God? They went after them. It was the Sanhedrin people, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They were the ones who hated. People of covenant didn't like the fact that they were saying this person who was of covenant now made a New Testament with a new people in Christ. They didn't like that. It changed the narrative. Yes. John 5, 19. 15, 15, 19. John 15, 19. And then to prove this point about when people, when people say, oh my gosh, well, Jesus, this is the, well, Jesus is, he loves the whole world. No, the world is speaking to the people of covenant, which he made clear in John 15, 18, and 19. But then he makes another statement in John 17, 9, on his prayer that only John records before he crosses the Kidron Valley to do his Gethsemane prayer, which John does not record. He records this personalized prayer of John 17, which in verse 9, Jesus says, I entreat for them, the apostles, the eleven, because Judas already is gone by now. He's gone. I entreat for them, not... For the world, I entreat for them whom thou hast given me, because they are mine. They are thine. Excuse me. He's talking about, again, not he's, not he's not praying for all the people of covenant. Even though, did Jesus not say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long to gather you as mother hen does her chicks, but you would not? Yeah. Did he came in, in Matthew chapter 1? Did it, not, did it not say that he came to save his people from their sins? Yes, it does say that. But at this point in time, the end of his ministry, he's praying for those out of those of covenant that he has called, and not just anybody, but the 11 specifically. He's praying for them. And he compares that to the world. And you say, what? By the way, let's we'll look further. Yes. I know, right? Then you, go to, then you go to Romans chapter 1, where he doesn't say, he doesn't say the world. He's referring to, uh, he says, in, for the invisible things, even the eternal power and deity since the creation, this is verse 20 of Romans 1, since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived by the things which are made, so they are inexcusable. So all things, he says, creation, left side of your margin, the catismo, the, of, of, the catesis of the world. So you see there a creation of the world. So he's going back to a creation, again, of all things. But then you go over to, remember, if you remember this before, from people that maybe may, you might have forgotten this from our study of the uh, Genesis and Second Peter, but in Proverbs 8.31, in Proverbs 8.31, Solomon writes that in verse 30 to 31, um, or verse 31, excuse me, 
rejoicing in the, in the world of his earth. And my delights were with the sons of men. And the rejoicing in the world of his earth. <laughs> what? That's how it reads. The world of his earth. So the world is not earth. You, you understand that, right? <laughs> it's not. So it, it's, a, it's a reference of within earth, our planet, he has a world he created, and he has the world of people within it that are covenant. So in Romans, he's about the world he created within this earth as he did the restoration in Genesis to show you that the earmarks and thumbprints of the creator of God are everywhere. But within the world he created is the world of people of covenant he called out through Abram. By the way, let's go to John in 15. Uh, uh, excuse me, 1 John 5. Go to 1 John 5. Those who under, just don't understand this phrasing of the world, they don't understand it. But if you go to 1 John 5, First John five, let me make, make my Yep. Yeah, first John two fifteen, excuse me. First John two fifteen. I said first John five. First John two fifteen. First John two fifteen he says, Love not the world. So there's a question for you. If if the world means this is first John two fifteen. If the world means everybody on the whole planet and God loves everybody, he wants you to do the same, then why does he say not to love them? Think what you're saying, people. Think. Did I write that in 1 John 2.15? No. I didn't write it. Not that smart. Nope. But what did Jesus tell John to write? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, nor the things in the world. What you talking about? By the way, this is a shot in the face of Hebrew Roots Movement. Stop loving law and festivals and all the things I put forth before for 2,000 years roughly to your people, they were just tutors. They were pedagogues. They were, they were like training wheels. If you want to keep carrying your porta potty around or your bedpan or wear your diapers and think you're somehow some spiritual people, I just want you to know you're, you're being ignorant. Ignant, okay? It's ignorant. Stop doing that. Stop loving the world, the covenant. The covenant and its way of life and its people's you don't have to be falling in love with that. How about falling in love with the one new man in Christ? How about falling in love with the things that he told you? How about that? How about falling in love with him and not the, 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 the framework of what he put forth? Okay, I know there's a lot of history there and a lot of, a lot of culture there. I get all that. But don't fall in love with it. Stop doing that. But yet, what do we do? Well, Christianity is Jewish and Jesus is Jewish and so therefore I'm going to fall in love with the Jewish heritage and that's going to honor Jesus. No. And that is what he's talking about in 1 John 2.15. And by the way, prove otherwise. Or unless I'm wrong and you're right, free will people, well, that means that he's telling us to not love people. He says, love not the world. That's what it says. Well, you can't say God so loved the world. That meant people in John 3.16. Same author, God Almighty, is telling the same writer in John before, God so loved the world. Now he tells us not to love the world. So if it means people over there in John 3, 16, then it means people here. If it means people here, then God's telling them not to love everybody, is he? Is he? You see, you see how your own so-called flawed theology breaks down when you start comparing truth with truth? It doesn't hold water, does it? Because you're wrong. There's no such thing as free will. It's all the man-made stuff in your head. It's all in your head. So I, on the board also, I put, I put on there, again, the phrasing of world versus the world versus the human populace versus people of covenant. But the whole idea behind free will, it, it comes back to this whole concept that people think, well, I have the ability to do what, what I want. I have the ability to do all this. So go to John chapter 6, the Gospel of John. Remember, John's whole... Um, book he's writing as jesus has the eagle symbol of god deity he's also writing in the sense of presenting jesus as god almighty he does no genealogy of jesus and goes right past his birth spends the dominant amount of time on his resurrection than any other gospel writer but he presents him as deity and god so in this book in john chapter six he goes even more so yes
the people of covenant. He's saying, love not the people of covenant and their ways. Don't be doing that. Don't be doing that. Don't be loving them. Don't be loving them. Because they were loving the people of covenant more than they were loving God. They were trying to honor their heritage before God. The same reason why Jesus would say, unless a man hate his mother and father, brother and sister, you, you can't, unless you want to be my disciple, you can't do that unless you hate those people. He's talking about the same thing here. The audience in 1 John was an audience of Jewish believers who were not understanding that the Jewish history and heritage that they had was no longer a priority and was no longer any superiority and was no longer be a part of what they entrenched themselves with and engaged themselves in. That's why in first that's why in, 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 in first John earlier he mentions about his appreciation and appreciator. They were confused by the Judaism of their belief system. He was talking to an audience again who was convoluted with some of their Hebrew traditions and heritages, heritage, heritage, excuse me, customs and manners that they could easily be entrenched in. He's saying, Don't love that. Don't love the people of covenant. No. You love them more than me? You love them more than what I imparted to you? No. He's not meaning don't love them in, in a general sense. He means in, in the context of comparing that to himself, to what he's done for them. That's what he's talking about. In the whole entire book, he talks about that. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, it's there for an encouragement, for an excitement to 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 learn from, but not to align ourselves with some. We have to obey these festivals or do these enchantments or no, that's not no, that's I don't have to wear a prayer shawl or do a prayer belt and start filling out the little knots. I, I, no, it's not for me. That's not for me. Well, that's just, it's, and people people like that heritage things, like to dress in a way that oh look, I have this and I mean, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. So in, in John chapter 6, in John 6, as you can see, Jesus uh, talking about this issue, uh, about how we come to, to know him. In verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me by no means of hunger, and he who believes into me will never thirst. So there's the free will person going, you see, he who believes and he who thirsts, you see, Jesus is saying, we all have free will to do that. Okay, wait, keep reading. Verse 36, but I said to you that not that but that you have even seen me and yet do not believe whatever the father gives me will come to me and him who comes to me. I will in no means reject because I have descended from heaven that not that I may do my not that I may do my will, but the will of him who sent me. So wait a minute, excuse me. Um, <laughs> and, and this is verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me that I may lose nothing of all that he has given me but may raise up at the last day, for this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone seeing the Son and believing into him may have only in life and will raise him up in the last day. So Jesus, earlier again, makes it clear that in verse 36, I said to you that even, I said to you that you have even seen me and yet you do not believe. And he goes on to say about 37, whatever the Father gives me will come to me. And him who comes to me, I'll no eyes reject. And over in verse 46, he says, Nothing, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. So you're talking about things that you cannot see and you cannot do unless permitted by God. So I'm trying to figure out where do you get this free will from? Did, did he say in verse 37, on, on the heels of 36, that Whoever, whatever the Father gives me will come to me because he chose so? I doesn't say that. The Father did that. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the believes ongoing in, let's see here. In verse 36, it's in the singular. Uh, and in the... It's in verse 36, it's singular. Yeah, it's just singular. But the one in verse 40 is plural. Oh, okay. And the one in verse 35 is also plural. So verse 35 and 40 are plural. Verse 36 is singular. So, the re and the word for believing. But the reality is, again, when, when we're looking at this verse, go back to Matthew 16 and look at how when this whole adage of the example was given to people 
about the apostles themselves who walk with Jesus and they're, and they're talking to him. And then Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 13, he came to the parts of Caesarea Philippi. He questioned his own disciples. Now remember, who was Jesus talking to? His disciples. Who were they? They're no slouches. These are people that have walked with him for a couple of years now. They're the ones who learned the most about what he's been teaching. They've been front and center. They're the ones that he chose. So they're, they're, they're the best of all of us when it comes to learning and knowing what Jesus' ministry is all about. They're, they're right there. They're the ones who are front of the class, right? So he says to his disciples, not to the whole crowd, to the disciples in Matthew 16, 13, who do men say that, I, that the Son of Man is? And they, the apostles, they replied, uh, some say John the Immerser, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter, of his own free will, lie. Peter said, thou art the Christ, son of living God. Now, I think that he's thinking, look what I figured out. Yeah. In verse 17, Jesus said, your free will is awesome, Peter. You figured this all out. You're a great guy. Nope, that's not what happened. Jesus said, answered him, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah. The flesh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but the Father of mine in the heavens. Excuse me? Excuse me? <laughs> now, how can Jesus make it any more clear for you when you say, well, I come to know Jesus because when someone preached to me about, about, about God's love and, and, and His mercy and His compassion and His uh, great and great uh, uh, forgiveness for uh, my sin, I grasp onto the cross of Jesus. Okay, you, you did all that. Awesome, beautiful, wonderful. On your own. So you're, so, wait, so you're telling me the Apostle Peter, who was the face and voice of Christianity for the first 10 years in the book of Acts, who also during the time of Jesus' ministry was the one who always wanted to lead first by wanting to make sure he did what was right. You're saying that even he who said the truth about Jesus was, even he was told by Jesus that was not his own flesh and blood figuring it out, that God and Father in heaven told him that truth. But you're telling me that you don't, you didn't need that intervention from God in heaven. You just on your own figured it out really just on your own on your own so you're greater than peter then you're you're just some, something about your intellect and your spiritual disposition is better than peter so if that's the case and i got a, another question so why is then your name not in the holy city why is it not your name that should be one of the ones who who judges the 12 tribes of israel because apparently you're greater than peter and he's given those two benefits that i'm not given and you're not given so i would argue that you have a right before god to argue that that you should replace Peter because you're better than him because he was given by God that information not of his own free will and you're saying of your free will you figured out who Jesus was so if that's the case well then you're, you're better than him if you're better than him then that's pretty that's a pretty pretty big time statement to say and if that's the case then being better than any of the apostles would therefore I would think would get you in the argument of replacing them on, on the name of the holy city so once you once you go ahead petition God for that to be a seat and see how that works out for you not well, by the way. I don't suggest doing it. That's sarcasm. I would not do that. That is very really dumb to think that. Yes. No man comes to the Father but by me. Yes, yeah, what he said. Yeah, no, that's right. No one, comes, no, no one comes to the Father but by me. So when he's, when he's saying this to Peter, he's making it clear that free will did not do it. So I always ask the person the, the, the question that I was first presented with long ago, and, and it did dawn on me when in, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you're saved by grace through faith. And, and, and I knew that, but when someone made that statement to me, they go, Preston, just think about it. I think, I think it was a guy named Greg uh, at the time, Greg Umquist, and he, he's different, I believe, now. But back in the day, he, he said, okay, well, um, I think it was him, uh, or him or somebody said to me, well, imagine like you, you're two people raised the same parents, the same DNA code, you're like twins, and you had the same experiences, no, 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 living in the same environment your whole life, and you're both like the age of like 12, and then somebody comes to you and says, this is who Jesus is. And I go, okay, so same similar DNA code, twins, same like experiences, same parents, everything's the same. And then I get to this place where they talk about Jesus. And then this person says, your brother says, I believe in Jesus. I, I like that story. I'm going to go with that. I'm good to go. And you say no. Why? I go, I don't. Why would he say yes? I, I don't. <laughs> and they say, well, did he, did he figure it out and say, this sounds great to me and God loves me. I'm going to go with that. And you said, I don't believe it. It sounds too hokey. And you said no. Well, so what was it exactly? What, what made you say no and him say yes? And I'm like, and that got me thinking, that logical, common sense, like what does make you believe? And if you, as soon as you start to say the truth, what you really feel, which is, well, I just heard Billy Graham say that I was going to go to hell and, 
and I heard him say that, that, that I was being judged for my sins. And so that, that's an emotional plea then. You're saying your emotional plea to your guilt caused you to say yes to Christ. And therefore, that's rationalizing. Therefore, that's fear, that's guilt, that's desire for forgiveness, which is not by grace through faith then. If it's by grace through faith, that means you have nothing to do with it. But, but if it plays on your emotions or your thoughts, you're, you're entertaining the fact that you contributed to your salvation. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's a... <laughs> I couldn't get around that. That's a logical conclusion, that you cannot get around that. Either it was apart from your emotion and thought, or your emotion and thought was involved in that process of you trusting in Christ. And most people who believe in free will, if they're honest, will say, well, yeah, I thought it through. And Okay, then, you're, then think what you're saying. Then you would did not, then it wasn't by grace through faith then, it was by your works. That's a work. You're rationalized. You, 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 you weighed out the factors. Whether how long or how short you did that in, you, you did a consideration of the information. And how could you do that if you were enchained in sin, darkened in darkness, and you have no choice to see God who's the light? How did you do that? How? Unless God opens your eyes first. And that goes back to, again, we're going to end with this, this comment that Apostle Paul makes. People gloss over. Go to Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul makes the most powerful comment that I think is something we should all re always remember. In verse 20 of Galatians chapter 2, he says, I have been crucified together with Christ. And that's ongoingly crucified. He's ongoingly going through this death to his flesh. It's plural. Yep ongoingly death to my flesh with Christ he said still I live yet no longer I but Christ that lives in me so Paul is talking about an ongoing relationship of dying to himself dying to his flesh as Christ died on the cross to put to death our sin and flesh and spirit as well as we happen physically to him but Christ lives in me he says in Galatians 2 20 in verse 20 the latter part he says for that life which I now live in the flesh or it says, I live in flesh, in circoi. It's, it's in faith I live. He says, in faith I live. But, he says, <laughs> Louis says, it's in faith I live. I live in the, but in that faith is in the Son of the God, of that who loved me. So in other words, what he's saying is, what he's telling you is, the faith he has to, to live in is the faith that the Son of God gave him. You go, what? No, it's by grace through faith you're saved, and your faith what saved you. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, we have no faith. There's no such thing. We, we, we have no faith. God, faith is believing in God's word. How can you believe in God's word if you don't know he exists? How can you believe in God's word if you don't even know how to understand what light is from darkness and you're conceived in sin and all you do is darkness and desire darkness? No one seeks after God. Remember Psalm 14, Romans 3, 10 to 12? Remember? So the whole reality is when he says here that he lives by the faith of the Son of God, he means that the God's, God the Son imputed his faith into him. It's almost like, like in the Garden of Eden. The, the clay man was just there. And then God went, <sighs> and then, I'm a real boy. We came to life. That's how it happened. We just, like that. There was no life. There was no like, hey, wait, wait. Not yet, not yet. Wait, okay, let me, I want to stand up right, good posture. Okay, now breathe into me. That's not what happened. There was no, where is there a conversation with the clay man saying, okay, just a minute, let me get my fingers, I'm going to make a fist, let me just, let me see, okay, okay, my blood's moving, okay, now I'm breathing, now, 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 do it now. That's not what happened. Don't give me the, okay, I got to comb my hair, just a minute, just a minute, okay, now breathe into me. That's not what happened. It was a lifeless lump of clay that was formed and fastened into a man, and then God breathed into that man. Genesis 2, 7, he became a living soul, because his ruach, Breathed into him. So Paul was saying, I'm, I'm alive in flesh, and my soul is alive, and my spirit is dead. And then God, the, the Son, infused his faith in me. And that faith in me, of his faith in me, brought me to life spiritually to believe and know it was him. And then I and he so he basically infused in me his faith, and then I reached out for his hand. 
you can't reach out to his hand unless people say, well, well, if you're drowning in the ocean and I'm trying to save you and I throw a preserver at you, you got to grab and hold on to it and that's how you're saved. The only problem is I'm not on the body of the water on the top floundering. I'm on the ocean floor. My lungs are filled with water. I'm already comatose for quite a while. I've been down there for hours. I'm clinically, biologically, physically, beyond reprehension, dead. And then God went, and brings me up. That's what happened. That's what Paul said happened to him. You say, when did that happen? Uh, you know when it happened. In Acts chapter 9. He goes, where can I go and kill some more people that believe in Jesus? I'm going to kill some more men and women and children and burn the villages. And all of a sudden, <laughs> knocks on his butt, literally. Blinded. Who are you? I am Jesus when you persecute. Say again. You're who? Yeah. Yeah, that, that. Wow, wow. <laughs> so when you talk about the he on his own, just, I'm going to look for Jesus today. That's not what happened. He's looking to kill folks who believed in Jesus that day. And so Paul's making it clear for you. Make no mistake about it. We're all doing our own life's journey. I'm going to go to work today. I'm going to go do my sin today, of whatever that is, my self-consumption, of my power play, of my career ambition, of my love and life, of, of the music, of the arts, of whatever it is, you know, of my relationships, of my, of, my, of my form and function, of how great I am, and this and that. And you, we all just get engaged in this worldly life that we're in. And all of a sudden, God just goes, wham! And he just brings his faith into our life of God the Son and God the Son's faith in us. It's alive, Jack. And it makes you go, it's just like, it's like all systems check. Power up. You just power up. All of a sudden, your spirit just comes alive. And you're like, what just happened? He goes, yeah. God, the Son's faith just infused you. It's like this power switch into your spiritual being. Just all the switches went on. Click, 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 click. Everything just went on. And the only action to take at that point is to, is, to, is to then react, respond to what he already acted in you, which is making his faith come alive in you. And that's what Paul's talking about in Galatians 2.20. And the only reason he's able to live an ongoing way of putting death to his flesh is that he's ongoingly embracing that faith of the Son of God in his life, actively. It, it, it came into him passively without his actions, and now he's saying, oh, oh, oh. He lit me up like a Christmas tree spiritually. I'm going to hold on to him like Jacob did. I'm not going to let go until I get all that blessing out of this faith that God has infused in me. That's what Paul's talking about. But yet people want to act like, oh, I came to Christ on my own. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Well, I figured it out. Then you're saved by works then. I'll give you the free will. I'll give you the did it by yourself as long as you're willing to say that you've made it up those words and you secondly are saying that you were saved by works i'll give i'll give it to you as long as you're willing to say that those words don't exist in scripture free will and that you actually also are willing to say that you were saved by works not by grace through faith if you want to say those two things fine fine then i'll just i won't argue with you about it i'm not even if you don't say those two things i'm not going to argue about it because you're wrong there is no free will again you have choices and you're responsible and we're accountable Choices are nothing but options. Freedoms we are given by God. And those freedoms given by God are only given in relative nature to what he allows us to do and what we're able to do. Period. None of us have absolute freedoms. Not even the man and woman in the garden had absolute freedoms. Did they? When they were sinless, did God put restrictions in place? Yes. Proving to you not even in a sinless state, mankind was never put in a position to have free will. No. There was always restrictions in place and abilities in place of what they could and couldn't do. Period. Full stop. Their freedoms were relative to the restrictions and abilities God gave them. Period. Period. Satan didn't understand that, right? I mean, he, he thought he could just... That, the whole free will thing comes from him because he was in heaven. And we'll get to him later about doing a chair that cover it, thinking he could do that very thing that people are trying to purport today, that you can just refute God. He's like, he, he tried that? It didn't work out well. So why do you keep remembering to repeat, repeat that story again? You had something to do with your existence. If he tried going after that venue of thought, 
uh, the ending game to that is not good. So why would you want to repeat that? Or I'll take a page from his playwright and say, I want to repeat what you're doing. It looks pretty good. No, it looks bad. It's pretty awful. Why would you want to repeat that? It's just dumb. Why? Why would you want to repeat what you already see is playing out before you as a horrible origination of thought that he thought he could have his freedoms, if you will, that were relative to what God gave him to usurp God and act like he had some autonomous right. God goes, no, you don't. And because you think this way, um, you're gone. Like forever. Like, what? No, you're out. You're gone. See you, bye. I mean, and, we're, we're, we, and we go, no, nah, he didn't mean that. We're going to copy that idea about we're going to do what we want to do and, and we're free and God just knows it all. And Okay. So you're based on wanting to emulate Satan. That's what you're doing. When you say you have free will, I want you to know this, you're emulating your, the father, the devil, who is the author of lies, the father of sin. You're emulating his agenda. Because God's agenda from the book of Genesis, show me the book of Genesis, where God's agenda was for you to be autonomous, do whatever you wanted. Is that what it's, that would, just, just, for, just read it yourself. Forget what preachers say, forget what I say. Read Genesis, what did God do? God created the man, made the man. Then out of the woman, out of the man, he put the woman. He formed and fashioned the man. And out of making him, he sculpted and built her. And then they cleaved to each other. She was pregnant with Abel. And he gave them rules about tending the garden, right? He gave them restrictions about the tree of good and evil. Well, he said it to the man. Didn't say it to the woman directly. That we, it's recorded anyways. But you hear and see this in Scripture where God did not give them autonomous freedoms. He gave them an obligation of obedience, of servitude. Gave them freedoms relative to the restrictions of what they could and couldn't do. Isn't that what you read? That's what I read. Where's there this, where, where this autonomy? They can just go, pitchoom, and go off to Saturn. Pitchoom, and go to Mars. Pitchoom, and go to the moon. Since, since when did they do that? When, when did it say they could just, if they were free, do what they wanted? What come they, how come they, come, they, come, they, come they couldn't fly? How, like Laney said, how come they couldn't live forever? How come they just can't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to free free not to die? Well, I'm just wondering, your freedom is relative to your restrictions, to your abilities. That's what makes Jesus God, because he has, God is the only one with free will, to do autonomously whatever he wants. When he wants, how he wants, however he wants. Yeah, yeah, and then, yep, I mean, you see, then you see that freedom, and for what it is, different from choices, and you see that God started off the beginning of mankind, sinlessness, with still restrictions based on the abilities and and, and 